I'm Evan. Today, I am going to be sharing with you my experiences and some of my learnings with authorization for retrieval augmented generation, specifically authorization relating to Google Zanzibar and relationship-based access control. I'm really excited. Um, as a way of introduction, I'm a solutions engineer at AuthZ. At AuthZ, we are the maintainers of SpiceDB. Uh, it's an open source relationship-based access control system inspired by Google Zanzibar. I've worked with several companies and helped several companies to implement uh, access control for RAG pipelines. Uh, I have, it's been a really interesting process working with these companies to implement authorization for RAG pipelines. I've learned a lot and I'm excited to share some of my learnings with you here today. And finally, uh, I live in Colorado uh, and uh, as a stereotypical Colorado resident, I love to ski and mountain bike outside of work. So I just wanted to kind of lay out the agenda uh, for the next about 20, 25 minutes here. Um, we're gonna chat about why authorization for RAG is important. Uh, we'll do a overview of relationship-based access control in Zanzibar and a quick demo of Zanzibar. Uh, we'll talk about uh, RAG authorization architecture, and then we will finish with a demonstration uh, using relationship-based access control in a Google Zanzibar inspired authorization system for RAG authorization. So it should be a fun few minutes here. Um, so, you know, why, you know, why should you care about th th this talk? Um, from what I'm seeing, the companies that are coming um, and I'm, I'm chatting with is that they're telling me that it's not adequate for users of applications that are powered by RAGs, things like chatbots, to be able to augment their prompts with all of the data um, that that is that is available from an organization, um, and so just like you have access control inside your Google Drive, you should also have access control for what data users can use to augment their prompts. Uh, one example I like to give is that your company may have sensitive financial data. Um, so it's natural that perhaps the accountants in your company uh, want to use that sensitive financial data to augment their prompts. That could be really helpful. That could increase their productivity. However, it might not be a good idea for people outside of your finance and accounting department to be able to use that data to augment their prompts. That might be sensitive data. And that's where we need to implement authorization into our RAG pipelines to ensure that only the users who are authorized to view and who need to view that data are those who can use that data to authorize, to, to augment prompts. So that was a practical example, um, but if you look at kind of the, the ecosystem, um, it very much seems that RAG and vector search are growing at a rate like I, I, I've never really seen a technology grow uh, as quick uh, as, as these technologies. Um, I think it's interesting to look at uh, Elastic's website. You know, there's no longer mentions of keyword search. It is AI, it is, um, it is uh, RAG, it is vectors. Um, and so a lot of these traditional companies have fully switched uh, towards these uh, AI search paradigms. And it, it's really interesting to see. And I think that is an indicator that it is growing really quickly, especially for enterprises. Um, it's also uh, interesting to see how relationship-based access control really excels with vector search authorization. I, I've seen this firsthand and I'm gonna demonstrate this to you today. Relationship-based access control, especially relationship-based access control based on Google Zanzibar, has support for both pre and post filtering, which is advantageous. We'll see that more later. It's also more granular. We can ask questions like, can this specific user view this specific object? 
And within Reback, we can support all the other paradigms like policy-based access control, role-based access control, all within Reback, while also being able to move beyond those more traditional paradigms uh, with additional complex authorization logic. And I'm, I'm looking forward to showing you a bit more about that here in a moment. So we've been talking about relationship-based access control and Zanzibar. We should probably just stop and explore those concepts briefly. So relationship-based access control uh, was popularized by Google's Zanzibar. It did exist before Zanzibar, um, but Zanzibar is what popularized it. Zan there is a Google Zanzibar paper uh, where you can read in depth about Google Zanzibar. Google Zanzibar is Google's internal authorization system that they use to handle massive throughputs. And they distributed uh, this authorization system globally around the world. The paper uh, on this system is, is really fascinating. And um, it is based on relationship-based access control. So Google Zanzibar is a relationship-based access control authorization system. It is a flexible system. We talked a little bit about this. Uh, you know, relationship-based access control has a lot of advantages when it comes to bespoke authorization logic that does not fit well into policy or roles. Additionally, systems inspired by Google Zanzibar are scalable because they implement a really interesting hotspot cache. Um, we won't be able to have time to go into that today, but I definitely encourage you to read the Zanzibar paper to kind of learn more about that. Additionally, uh, systems based on Google Zanzibar have some really interesting consistency properties. So when you make a request to a Google Zanzibar based system, you would be able to either skip the cache or use the cache. Uh, additionally, there is an existing uh, concept called Zookies, which allows you to say, use the cache if it is at least as fresh as this particular timestamp. Um, really interesting stuff. We can't get into all of that today, but again, I encourage you to read the Zanzibar paper to learn some more uh, about how Zanzibar implements that if you're interested. Um, as I was kind of alluding to, Zanzibar uh, exists in the real world. There are two implementations that I think do a great job of staying really true to what is described in the Zanzibar paper. Uh, those are Okta FGA, which is actually a sandbox project with the CNCF and SpiceDB. Um, that is another open source Zanzibar implementation in the real world. Um, so let's explore relationship-based access control a little bit more. Um, so this is kind of an uh, a illustration of what relationship-based access control could look like. So we would have uh, a user. A user could be a viewer of a folder. That folder is evil plans in this scenario. And this evil plans folder uh, has a document nested underneath of it. And that document is called steal the moon. And in a relationship-based access control system uh, like uh, OpenFGA or SpiceDB, we could define um, a uh, authorization logic that says that if you are a viewer of the documents folder, then you have permission to view the, the document. Let's go ahead and actually do that right now in SpiceDB. So here we're looking at the SpiceDB playground. It's SpiceDB running in the browser. It's located at play.authz.com. Uh, and the first thing you have to do in a Google Zanzibar system is to define uh, objects. Um, and we define objects with our schema. Um, so we will say we have users. We can say that uh, folders are another object type we have in our system. Um, and we can also say that there are documents. Um, and we will say that users uh, can be a viewer of a folder as we talked about in that diagram earlier. And we'll all say that you can view a folder if you are a viewer. 
Uh, and now we'll move on to defining documents. Uh, so documents have a folder. Documents belong to a folder. And we'll say that you can let's expand that a little bit. Um, we'll say that you can view a document. Sorry, let's make that singular too. Um, you can view a document if you can view the documents folder. Well, that makes sense. So um, what we did here is we were basically saying uh, walk this relationship. And so walk the folder relationship to see if the user has view permission. And if they have view permission on the folder, they have view permission on the document. So great, we've defined objects. We defined how they can relate to one another. Now let's actually relate some objects to one another. So let's say we have a document. Um, document is steal the move. The folder. The folder is evil plans. Oops. And evil plans as a viewer. And that viewer is going to be the user, Tim. So now let's check to see if the user, Tim, can view document steal the moon. And Tim can view the steal the moon document uh, because he can view that document's folder. Um, and he can view that document's folder because he relates to that folder as a viewer. Um, now let's, um, so you can see that there, it might help to kind of see, see, see the schema with that as well. So I'll stop there for a second, but let's also go and add uh, another relationship. So let's add, let's just add document XYZ to folder evil plans. Um, and let's list, oops, that's not what we wanted. Let's list, Um, all of the documents that the user Tim can view. And we made that plural. Let's change that. Um, and we can see here that the user Tim can view two documents, steal the moon and XYZ. Um, this was a lookup resources API request uh, that uh, was will really come in handy later uh, when we talk about pre-filtering uh, authorization in RAG pipelines. Um, so let's get back uh, to the presentation here. Um, and let's look, kind of shift gears and start looking at some RAG pipeline architectures. Um, and so we can see here that um, there's two phases uh, to a RAG pipeline. There's going to be the initial ingestion of data, and then there's the query retrieval and response of data. So the initial ingestion of data would involve ingesting, ingesting data, either structured or unstructured data from a knowledge base, processing that data, embedding uh, that data, and writing that data to a vector database. And then we look at the query retrieval and response. So a user uh, is going to make a query or request to an application. This could be a chat bot. The chat bot is going to embed the user's query. It's going to take the embedded query and find relevant embeddings. And it's going to take the data stored alongside the embeddings and provide that data as context alongside the prompt to the large language model. The large language model will issue a response. Uh, that response will be uh, augmented with the uh, contextual data that we picked up in the vector database. Uh, and that response will be returned to the user. This was a very quick just uh, overview of, of, of RAG architecture. If you are new to RAG architecture, I definitely recommend pausing this video and taking a moment to just familiarize yourself a bit more with RAG architecture. There's a lot of uh, good videos out there. 
Um, but the problem with this specific architecture is that there is no authorization. Um, so in, if a user, uh, say this user is someone who should not have access to sensitive financial data, and they ask, what was the company's revenue in Q4 of 2023? And would say it's a private company that doesn't like to share their revenue. Well, that would be problematic because there is, and, and we'll say that revenue data uh, was in this knowledge base and you know, therefore lives in the vector database. And that would be problematic uh, because that user could ask that question to the chatbot. The chatbot would uh, be able to actually fetch uh, that data from the vector DB and fetch that financial data to use to augment a prompt to an LLM. And therefore, uh, a user could actually have access to sensitive financial data uh, by asking a chatbot with, uh, with, with no authorization implemented uh, in the RAG process. And that's problematic. And so we need to implement um, some authorization into this pipeline. And let's look how we do it. So this is going to be a post-filter approach. Uh, so in this approach, you can see here, you know, we have the embedding model, we ask, a, we make a query, uh, the embedded query is returned, and then we get some relevant embeddings from the vector database. And what I didn't mention in the last, uh, the last diagram is that we can actually attach metadata to embeddings. So we can attach metadata to embeddings that indicates their object of origin. So an example of an object of origin might be something like document one, two, three. And so if a, if a user is authorized to view document one, two, three, they should be authorized to view and use embeddings that originated from document one, two, three. Um, and so what we can do here is that when we receive our relevant embeddings from the vector database, we can actually perform a check for each relevant embedding uh, to see if the user indeed has permission to view that embedding. So if we receive an embedding back, we might actually, we're not gonna ask if the user has permission to view an embedding. We would actually ask if the user has permission to maybe view a document that that embedding originated from. And we would know that document based on the metadata that's stored alongside the embedding. Um, so we would issue a check permission request until we have enough embeddings uh, to go ahead and issue that prompt to our LLM. So a lot of folks will say, I need at least five um, pieces of additional context before I go ahead and I make that prompt to the LLM. Or they'll say, I need to exhaust, uh, I need to exhaust all of the uh, embeddings that were returned, or I need at least five pieces. Um, the this is a, a good approach in, in, in many situations. Um, and this does allow you to get fine-grained authorization uh, on your embeddings. Um, where, where this approach sometimes uh, can be slightly problematic is if you have a low positive hit rate on the embeddings that are returned from your vector database. Um, so uh, in situations, if you have, uh, you know, say a thousand embeddings returned from your vector database, and I can only view one of those embeddings, we have to filter through uh, those embeddings um, until uh, we find the one I can view. And even then we're probably gonna keep filtering through those embeddings because we're probably gonna be looking for something like five embeddings. Uh, so if, if there's a low positive hit rate on you know, embeddings I'm authorized to view, this approach could be problematic. Um, and that's where um, the pre-filter approach comes into play. So uh, in this approach, um, we are going to make the query to our, let's say, you know, our chatbot application or whatever it might be. Um, we will embed the query. Um, and then before we do anything else, we're actually going to ask our Zanzibar-like system, what are the objects that I can actually view? Uh, and so we're going to get an array of objects that I can view. And then we're going to pass that array of objects that I can view uh, as a filter with our query to our vector database. We would receive all of the relevant embeddings back from the database, the vector database. And we would know that we are authorized to view all of those embeddings because we passed in that filter into that vector DB query. 
uh, we can then take the, those contexts from the embeddings um, and we can use those to augment the prompt to the LLM and then we can issue the response back to the user. Um, I'm going to focus the demonstration today on this pre-filter authorization architecture. Um, so let's move on here to the demonstration. We have some Python code. This, de this, demonstrate, uh, this presentation is actually running in a Jupyter notebook. It, for those who are interested, it's actually called Rise. That's a technology that allows me to present from a Jupyter notebook. It's really cool. I give them, give them a shout out. They are an open source tool. So we will go ahead and um, load our environment variables that we need. In this demonstration, we're going to be interacting and using uh, SpiceDB, Pinecone, OpenAI Embeddings model, and OpenAI ChatGPT 3.5, and also uh, Langchain. So a lot of really cool uh, popular technologies, um, and we'll be putting them all together to perform an authorized, to create an authorized RAG pipeline. So we've loaded the environment variables in from a file. Now we can look here, we're going to be writing a schema to a SpiceDB instance that we have running in the background. It's a pretty simple schema. We have users. Users can be a viewer of an article and the viewer of an article can view the article. So let's go ahead and write this schema. I also need to mention that uh, we're gonna be moving fairly quickly through this code. If you really wanna dig into this code, we are going to be trying to link it here in the description. If we can't link it in the description, uh, you can just go to the AuthZ blog uh, and you can find all of this code on the AuthZ blog. So let's go ahead and uh, write this schema to SpiceDB. So I went ahead and just did that. Next up, we are going to write some relationships. Um, we're gonna write two relationships. Um, both these relationships have user Tim as the subject. And so, and, and, and we're referencing the viewer relation. So this relationship is going to make Tim the viewer of article 456. This relationship is going to make Tim the viewer of article 123. And if you think back to our schema, this means that Tim should be able to view both article 123 and article 456. So let's go ahead and we'll write these relationships to SpiceDB. Okay, relationships are written. Now let's move on to setting up our Pinecone index. So this is a Pinecone serverless index, very easy to use. Um, so we are going to go ahead and set up that index and we are good to go. So moving on. Uh, so yeah, so we've, you know, we've initialized our Pinecone index. Uh, now we are going to write some data and embed some data to our, our, our vector DB, our, our Pinecone vector DB. So here we have some text. Um, this is says that Peyton Manning won the 2023 Oscar for the best football movie. Uh, that is not the case. There is no such thing as Oscar for best football movie and Peyton Manning certainly did not win it. And so this is something that, and this is a fact that will not be known to an LLM. And so if a user asks a question, something like who won the Oscar for best football movie in 2023, uh, well, that will be something that will have to be uh, you know, augmented with our prompt to our LLM. Uh, so alongside this data, we're going to store some metadata. Uh, we're going to say that uh, the metadata we're storing here is article ID 123. Uh, and so what, basically what we're saying is that this uh, text data originated from article 123, and that's important for authorization. Um, so we, we went ahead, um, that's okay, and we, um, we, we wrote this data to our vector database. Um, now we're going to go ahead here and we're going to perform a lookup resources request to SpiceDB to generate a list of articles that the user Tim is authorized to view. Um, so we can see here that Tim is authorized to view uh, articles 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6. And we're storing that as an environment variable called authorized articles. So there's a lot going on here in, in this particular block of code. Um, so we're not going to cover it all. What 
you really need to know here is that we are issuing a, a this is our query. This is this is our question. We want to know who won the 2023 Oscar for the best football movie. And um, an LLM shouldn't know this without augmenting the prompt. And, and we have provided that data to the vector database. Um, and so let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and initiate our query. Our query is going to try to augment the prompt with any relevant information stored in the vector database. And then most importantly, is that when we make the query to the vector database, we are going to have a filter. And that filter will be uh, restricting the embeddings that we are using to augment our prompt uh, to the embeddings uh, that uh, have an article ID that we are authorized to view. So let's go ahead and invoke this function. And we got our answer, that's expected. Um, so Peyton Manning won the Oscar for the best football movie that used the data from the vector database to augment the prompt. Uh, so it was able to issue a response to us. Now let's go ahead and delete a relationship in SpiceDB. So let's make it so that Tim is no, no longer related to article one, two, three as viewer. Awesome. And so now let's refresh the list of documents that Tim can view. Now, if Tim can only view one document, that's document four, five, six. So let's continue on here. Um, and so let's invoke that function again. So let's invoke that function that took the list of authorized articles and filtered the embeddings it used to augment the LLM prompt. Uh, based on what our user was authorized to view. So let's invoke this function again. And there is no information provided in the context. Um, and there's no information provided in the context uh, because when we deleted the relationship uh, that, that made Tim the viewer of article one, two, three, we lost uh, access uh, to, uh, to article one, two, three. So when we passed in the list of authorized articles as a filter into um, our vector DB query, we were only authorized to view four, five, six. And so we didn't, we weren't able to augment our prompt with that fact about Peyton Manning from the vector database because we were no longer authorized uh, to view that data. I hope you learned something today. You can find me in the CNCF Slack channel. You can just feel free to DM me there and keep the conversation going. I hope you really took something away today. And I, I hope that you feel that you can now use a Google Zanzibar inspired relationship based access control system to implement authorization in your RAG pipelines. Thanks and have a nice day.